turn out. Uh, if you will open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Appreciate everyone pitching in this morning. Things have been slightly hectic and awkward since we have uh, been here, and, and actually all of 2020 has been slightly hectic and, and awkward. Uh, so I appreciate Sheldon jumping in. I, I threw it at him last minute, uh, completely unprepared, and, and I appreciate him doing such a great job of leading songs. Uh, Kurt and Miranda are going to be uh, moving down into North Carolina this week, so this will be the last time we get to see them, so make sure you guys get to say hi and, and bye to them um, and wish them luck in their, their new move. I know it's going to be a, a grand adventure for them to find a new place to live and start a new job and uh, the whole kit and caboodle, I hope, just the very best for you guys. Um, the kids are, obviously, we, we're kidless. Uh, they're going to be up in Ohio for the next day and a half. We're going to be picking them up tomorrow. If you're wondering, well, I did forget them, uh, but just forgot them in, in a different state. Uh, so that's where, where they are. Uh, full fair warning, um, I preached this morning and had my notebook with all my sermons in it, and I left it on the podium over at Happy Hills. So you guys get what I have from memory. So <laughs> if, if it goes terribly, you know why. Um, if it went terribly with my notebook, I would have no excuses, but I have a really good excuse today. Uh, so we're going to do our very best. So I want to look at two of the most popular stories, uh, famous stories from Luke is really what I want to do. And I want to pick up maybe some details that maybe we don't always talk about. So I want to go through them first, kind of as we normally do, and then maybe cycle back through a second time. The first one's going to be here in Luke chapter 10. If I say Luke chapter 10 and most famous story, obviously we're going to begin there in verse 25. So verse 25 is this parable of the Good Samaritan. So the lawyer comes to Jesus and asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, whether or not Jesus had interacted with this man previously, or this man had heard Jesus' sermons previously, I'm not entirely sure. There's been a long debate as you go through the entire Bible. What does God require of you? And it seems like a lot of different speakers had a variety of ways of summing up and condensing God's commands. We know Micah chapter 6, verse 8. That's one of the ones that we understand are kind of a condensation of God's commands. And Jesus has his own to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And interestingly enough, when this lawyer answers Jesus, how do you read it in verse 25 or verse 26? Verse 27 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So I would assume that this man had heard Jesus' sermons before and is repeating back to Jesus what he asked. And so Jesus then begins to tell him a parable. And the parable, here in verse 33, is a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, this man who had been beaten and robbed, in verse 30, and saw him and had compassion on him. And he went up to him, and he bound up his wounds, and he poured on oil and wine when he had set him on his own animal, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave him to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend I will pay when I come back. And Jesus asked the question, verse 36, Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, You go and do likewise. You know, this is probably one of the most famous Christian stories, if we're allowed to use that terminology. Everyone knows the term of being a good Samaritan. That is a ubiquitous term for kind of all Christendom, of being someone who's good. Sometimes we forget, though, that Samaritans uh, were not viewed inherently as being good people. For some reason, because we tell the story so often, Samaritan and good become synonymous but in their day and time, that was not the case. In fact, Jesus makes the point that Samaritans had no dealings with Jews, or Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Remember, the top ten tribes of Israel were taken off to captivity uh, and did not fully return in the same way that Judah returned in you know, full ways. And as you go through the time periods of Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that they kept strict records of who was parent to whom and who begot whom. And if you go through those books, you kind of get a little bit worn down by all of the genealogies as you read. But the whole point is that they preserved their nationality. They preserved their families. They preserved knowing who they were. And that lineage was unbroken for the sake of having the Messiah come through the lineage of David. But the northern ten tribes, that was not really the case for them. 
you know, they began to intermarry. Some of them were left in the land, and eventually some of them became known as the Samaritans, viewed as, you know, half-breeds, if you use such a derogatory term, individuals who were second-rate citizens, people who had really no standings in society. They weren't welcome into the temple. In fact, they worship in the mountains. Here are people who really had no dealings with one another, who generally believed in the same God, but didn't have a quite the same understanding what God required. And here's a man who sees somebody who he's never met, has no idea what's going on, in an area that he knows is a dangerous area, as is evidenced by the beaten guy right in the middle of the road, who knows if this is a ploy or a trick? If I stop to help this person, will I fall under the same thing that he's fallen under? Or if I stop to help him, is he tricking me that I might also be, or I might be beaten and not him? That doesn't seem to bother him in that sense. What he sees is someone who is beaten, nearly dead, and he has compassion on him. And so he takes his own animal, loads the man on it, binds the wounds himself, and then takes him to an inn. Not only that, does he pay for that day, all that he needs for that day, two denarii, and then this unknown quantity. I don't know how that would always be if you go up to an innkeeper and say, well, take care of this person, and whatever you pay, I'll come back later and pay the rest of it. You know, there is an idea of, I know I, I can afford 200 bucks to help this person, and I can, I'll gladly do that, and I'll self-sacrifice, and I'll make that work. There's a whole different th thing to say, here's 200 bucks, and whatever else you pay, I will gladly come back and pay more. That's a pretty big commitment. And so the question comes up, well, who proved to be a neighbor? Well, it's, it's this man. What does it mean for us to be individuals who, are, who love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself? You know, sometimes we don't view the Samaritan with such self-sacrifice as we really should. He went well above and beyond to do what we should be willing to do on a regular basis. You know, to put himself possibly in harm's way, to uh, give up some of his benefits and his blessings in order to provide for somebody else who is far less fortunate than he is, to go out of his way for someone who would consider him an enemy in the first place and just would have no care for his life one way or another, to then journey with him and then come back and check on him again and then pay not only for that day and the next day, but kind of an unknown quantity. Just keep on giving and giving and giving for this person. And what a huge bar for us to meet, meet up to, for us to be individuals who truly love as the Samaritan love for our neighbor. That's big. I mean, that is really big. But let's move on to our next story. We're going to keep our minds or fingers there in Luke chapter 10 and move over five chapters in Luke chapter 15. This is probably the second most famous story in the Gospel of Luke. Starting in verse 11 is the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, I don't know if you grew up hearing this story, maybe you had the same mental deficiency I did, because that's just how I grew up with mental deficiencies. But prodigal in my mind, in the same way that Samaritan equaled good in my mind, prodigal usually meant returning. But prodigal means that someone who left, who, who wandered off, who who abandoned all of the things he should have done. Or absentee son or you know, disappointment son. But in verse 11, we'll go ahead and read the parable together. It's definitely worth reading. He said, there's a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey to a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread but I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you in heaven before you, and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called a son. Treat me as you would a hired servant. And he arose and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. 
And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring a fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was found and they began to celebrate. I have heard it was said that maybe prodigal son is maybe not the best name for this parable. Maybe the long-suffering or the forgiving father is a better, better term for this parable. You know, here you see the heart of what it means to be someone who is truly penitent before God. You know, oftentimes we come to God and say, well, sorry, messed up, my bad. Do you mind if I come back in as a son and have all my inheritance back? Now, God is willing to do that. That's why it's the parable of the loving father or the forgiving father. But notice the heart of the prodigal son. The prodigal son said when he was far off, he said, I am not worthy to be called a son. I'm going to go to my father and ask only to be a servant or to be treated as a servant. Now, that is remarkable for the heart that we ought to have. That is the kind of way that we should bring ourselves before God. Kurt had mentioned Romans chapter 5 or read for us Romans chapter 5. That while we were weak, and while we were enemies, and while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That we don't deserve anything more. And if we, after presenting ourselves before God, after living a lifelong service to him, really all we can say is, I'm an unworthy servant. And that's still the principle that God gives forward to us. And yet, how many times we approach God on a much more haughty basis? Okay, I, I checked all the boxes, I went through all the things you needed me to do. I did my five plans of salvation. I did my five acts of worship. My hands are full of things that I've done for you. Let me in. Or treat me as being worthy. And yet the prodigal son has the right heart. The heart of an individual who comes before God of, as unworthy. Recognizing that he took all the blessings that God had given him. And then squandered them in an unworthy or riotous living. And now presents himself back to his father knowing that he deserves nothing from his hand. Those two parables in Luke chapter 10 and Luke chapter 15 are remarkable parables. And there is so much that we need to learn from them. Things that needed to sink deep into our minds and to really activate our hearts. But if you notice, I skipped over a few things. And maybe you didn't because oftentimes that's how we present the parables. We present them just like that. There's a man who is a Samaritan who found a beaten man and those two have the entire parable themselves. And then here in chapter 15, there is a son who has a father, and then the whole parable is just those two people. So I want to go back to Luke chapter 10, and I want to revisit these two parables for a moment. And notice that there are extra characters in both of them. We tell them as if they only contain two and most parables do. I mean, to be fair, you have the persistent widow who constantly presents herself before the judge. You have the neighbor who calls on his other neighbor to give him food in the parable. You, know, you have a whole bunch of rich men and Lazarus. The list kind of goes on and on and on about the two people parables. But when it comes to these two, there's extra people. And so in Luke chapter 10, I want us to begin with the context. Uh, I was listening to, to an individual recently who preaches out in California and he was making the point that he had this revelation one day the biggest revelation he ever had in his life which was the revelation of context meaning that God desired his passages to be understood in context I don't know what he was doing preaching for the previous couple years but uh, he had the revelation of context and I want to give you guys the same revelation of context so let's begin there in verse 25 so the lawyer comes and he comes to test Jesus what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus says, well, it's written in the law. How do you read it? And the man gives the right answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And here in verse 28, Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And then verse 29 happens. Desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? I want to know who do I have to act like this towards. 
And so Jesus replied, a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. Oftentimes, we skip right to the Samaritan, because that's the person who does all the actions. That's the person that Jesus tells him to imitate. But I want us to first consider the Levite and the priest, two individuals that you would say by all means, are a better person, quantifiably, in every way, better than the Samaritan. To them belong the promises, as, as Paul mentions over in Romans. To them belong the patriarchs, the promises, the law. All of the blessings of Israel belong with the Levite and the priests. Not only that, but they're Levites. They are sons of Aaron. They have a lineage tracing all the way back to Aaron, who served at the temple. You know, God has given them special allocations. They're individuals who present themselves on a regular basis before our God, who perform all the duties and rituals and rites of sacrifice and temple maintenance. They are people who constantly surround themselves with the law. They probably memorized most of the Old Testament. That is a part of what was kind of traditional at this point in time for the Levites. You want to talk about somebody who is upright and godly? These two men. And by every outward appearance, you would choose these two men to help you out in a spiritual work. You want someone to teach you, teach someone else? Come along with you. We're going to go knock, knock doors. We're going to go preach a gospel meeting. You would pick the first two men every time. Let's be very frank about it. And if we were to identify ourselves with the character, Levite and priest, that would be us. Individuals who are priests for God, who spend our life trying to be sanctified and holy and righteous before God. But notice what they did. Well, that's not, that's not my business right now. I have other things to be doing. You know, if he does die, then you know, I, I can be removed from the priesthood for a while, be unclean, and I have to go through the process of cleansing and ritual cleaning. You know, I can't perform my duties if this man dies in my care. You can think of all the excuses of this would be unsafe, I don't have time, you know, is this someone else's business, I don't know this person, you know, why would I be doing anything and that's his point these two people kept themselves unstained from the world you know in the parable that i think that's the entire point you know as james deals with in james chapter 1 and verse 27 pure and undefiled religion before god the father is to keep yourself unstained from the world check these two people had that in spades in the same way that i hope we also have that in spades. But yet, James goes further to say that they should also visit orphans and widows in their afflictions. That our actions towards other people are as equally important as our righteousness or sanctification before God. That those is an equally important thing. These two men were not commended by God. And that this is the hard-hitting question for us. Maybe this isn't the parable of the Good Samaritan. Maybe this is a parable of an unloving, unmerciful Levite and priest. Because that's who this lawyer is. This lawyer goes around saying, well, I need to find out exactly who it is I have to show love to. And anyone who's not on that list that I'm just free and clear from not having to do anything. And we spend a lot of time looking at the brotherhood and saying, well, I know that I need to do good for the brotherhood. And if I can do good for anybody, I'll drop everything. I'll come help you move. I'll come clean your lawn. I'll help you with the car maintenance. You know, we'll make knives together. Whatever it is that you want to do for the brotherhood, I will stop and I'll do it. But for the person that's just on the side of the road, the person who's kind of out of luck, the person who has a hard time in life, the person that I don't know, then, well, I can pass him by without really caring a whole lot. And maybe that's the real point of the Good Samaritan. Is here are two people who are godly people, who are God-fearing people, who are God-loving people, who have forgotten to be merciful and loving to their neighbor, realizing that anybody who has need becomes their neighbor. If I am close enough to you to see your problems, if I'm close enough to you to help in some way with your problems, then it's my obligation to be neighborly. 
And so sometimes we focus only on the main character of the Samaritan and only the main character of the man who fell among the robbers when there's actually extra characters. And those two characters are the person, or the two people, that he wants the lawyer to identify with, to recognize that this is what he's trying to do. Well, I'm trying to be the Levite who is righteous towards God, but unmerciful towards those around me. The same thing goes as you go over five chapters into Luke 15. Again, revelation of context this morning. First two parables in Luke chapter 15 are the lost sheep and the lost coin. Not nearly as popular, not nearly as dramatic as the prodigal son, but in both of these are two things that are lost. A sheep that's lost and a coin that is lost. And when they are found, here in verse 6, when he comes home and all together, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. And then he reminds them in verse 7, So I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. And then the parable of the lost coin. In verse 9, when she had found it, she called together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that was lost. Just so I tell you, there is more joy before the angels of God than one sinner on one sinner who repents. And then right into the parable of the lost son. So go from sheep, coin, lost son. And the same thing happens here in verse 23. Bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate or rejoice for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was found. Let's celebrate. But we were introduced very briefly back in verse 11 to the extra character. There was a man who had two sons. And then in verse 25 begins the narrative of the second son. Now his older son was in the field. And he came and he drew near the house and he heard the music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked him what this meant. And he said, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he had received him back safe and sound. But he, the older son, was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And while this is a wonderful example of what it means for us to come penitent back to God, and a perfect example of what it was like for God to welcome back us, his children. There is also the other side of the coin, the other side of the sheep, the other side of the lost son, which is the older brother, the one who hadn't wandered so far. I want us to really consider this for a moment, that you are in this family that is dysfunctional. Dysfunctional enough that one of your siblings comes to your parents and says, well, instead of me waiting until you kick the bucket, I want you to give me all that you can give me right now that would be mine. That would be a strange request. I don't know how it always worked back then, but if I were to ask my parents that now, like, could you just go ahead and sell your house so I can get half of that? Uh, that would be a really odd request. And for the parent to go, yeah, I'll do that. And then for your younger sibling to go and to... Do as he did here. He said, wasted all your money on prostitutes, riotous living, gambled away, partied away, so that even from a foreign country, we hear what their life is like. And for that child to come back home after you worked so hard and you were the good kid, for your parents just to begin to dote on that kid. Never asking for him to repay all the inheritance. Never asking for him uh, to, to go through this long process of you know, begging and you know, work yourself up from a servant back. And maybe if you prove yourself right, you'll be back in the house as a son. No, just right then and there, full celebration, full rejoicing. You're back. Let's, let's get back into our old life. That'd be huge, wouldn't it? For you to know that your parents 
have done this for the kid that wasted everything, who lived such a terrible life. And yet, again, the same thing comes up for us. If we are in this story, who do we most identify with? Now, some of us, maybe rightfully so, identify with the prodigal son. Maybe some of us have really gone off and really lived a riotous life before coming back. Maybe some of us have lived a lot closer to the Father for a lot longer. Maybe we didn't go off and spend all of our life or a large portion of our life with prostitutes and riotous living. You know, I want to talk, just consider for a moment, from a Jewish perspective, he wasn't just out in the field with goats and sheep, he's in the field with pigs, an unclean animal, and he's longing to be like the unclean animal. I mean, this is a pretty disgusting viewpoint from a Jewish perspective. And the brother sees all of this, or hears of all of this. Where, where do we normally fit in this scale? And not all of us. I'm not the same way all of us have to fit in, in one side or the other. You know, a lot of us were kind of raised in the church. There's nothing actually raised in the church, but a lot of us have, have made that our, you know, have, we're raised with parents who are Christian. We're raised going to church. Maybe that's a better phrase of, of that. Maybe we have gone through a period of, of small rebellion and then have come back. But for the most part, I would guess that a lot of us identify with the older brother. We didn't run off. We didn't spend all of our time with the prostitutes. We didn't spend all your money. We didn't waste everything. We were here working for you. I was the good kid the whole time. And sometimes we begin to be resentful for those who get all the celebration after they live such a wretched life. We can look down on people who are in the circumstance right now who are still in the riotous living and thinking, well, they just don't deserve it. But I do because I've been here the whole time. I deserve the fatted calf. I deserve all the love and all the praise. I deserve all the accolations from my parents because I have lived a life that is worthy of being in my father's house. But the case is, is that all of us, to some degree, have been the prodigal son. And sometimes we delude ourselves, forgetting that we have sunk so low into sin and that we have sold ourselves so far out of God's mercy that it's only by his mercy we are where we are now. And then standing on that pivotal shore of being in God's house, we look at those outside and say, well, you don't deserve what you're getting. Or you don't deserve what you would get if I were to extend grace and mercy to you. We like identifying, we like looking at the prodigal son and seeing ourselves as being, receiving mercy. But all of chapter 16 is also calling for us who are in God's house to rejoice and to look for the opportunity to find the sheep and to find the lost coin and to find the lost son. To be individuals who are exceedingly glad that that lifestyle of being lost can be over and a lifestyle of being found can begin. But sometimes we are very comfortable in God's house and we could care less what other sons or daughters are living a riotous life because we're here. And we're working hard to deserve being here. And they haven't worked as hard. And if they want to work that hard, then they can come in. But that isn't how the Father treated us. And that isn't how the Father wants us to treat them either. So as you look at the, the two biggest parables, and that's the right way to phrase it, in Luke, in chapter 10 and in chapter 15, recognize that there's other characters. And maybe those other characters are really the focal point of the story. Maybe in Luke chapter 10, he wants us to see that we could become the Levite and the priest. That we can view ourselves as just being a holy to God, living a righteous life, and that should be good enough. Forgetting that there are others that were around that we have to be merciful to receive mercy. Maybe in Luke chapter 15, we see the prodigal son and we identify with that, but we forget that we also can be the older brother who should both look, seek, and rejoice. I want us to really consider those two parables as you go throughout this week. Ask yourself, what have you done to be an individual who has acted as the Samaritan, who has shown mercy to those who are far less fortunate than you? Have you gone as far as he has? Or have you been someone who has just been righteous to God and failed to be merciful to others? 
as it comes to the parable of the prodigal son, have you really come to God with a pen and a heart as you ought to? And once you had come to him, do you look on those who are lost with, with a degrading eye? Well, you deserve to be where you are, or do I find an opportunity to seek mercy and to forgive, forgive as God forgave? Because if we look at those two parables and fail to see ourselves in the extra characters, then we failed the entire point of the parable. I know we have a song picked out for us. And the invitation is always open. We just have an opportunity to extend it or to remind everyone that it is there. That if you are in the position of, the par of one of those parables, where you're needing God's forgiveness and mercy, where you're outside living a riotous life, or if you have slipped from living the good life back into an unrighteous life. And this is no better opportunity than now to make that right. If we can help you, let us know as we sing. I must needs go home by the way.